Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Webinar Series. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure that your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. Our upcoming webinars are on the 8th of August. Uh, we'll be hearing from James Tanner. He's giving a presentation on the history of DNA. And then following that, we'll have a webinar with Bob Taylor. He'll be updating us on some of the new features that, uh, that have been made on the website of the Family History Guide. So that'll be on Thursday the 15th. And then uh, the next Two webinars um, following that are um, with Catherine Grant and another webinar with Sarah Stoddard. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to the recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. During the webinar, if you have any technical difficulties, if you can't uh, hear the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns and help you out with that. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation on choosing the right tool mobile versus web. Catherine, uh, Catherine Grant, um, after years on the sidelines, started doing family history and discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton Sunday uh, Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. Catherine works for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a technical writer and instructional designer focusing on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and spring lilacs. So if Catherine's ready, we'll turn the time over to her. Great. Thank you so much, Marin. So we'll just do our sharing here. Great. I think we're ready to go. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I've been really excited about this webinar, and I hope that you will find it as helpful to watch as I did to prepare. So I wanted to start out by sharing one of my favorite quotes by a uh, a, a brother by the name of David Rencher, and he happens to be the chief genealogical officer of FamilySearch right now. He said, I love my computer. I love it for everything it can do for me. And I relate to that so much. But he goes on to say, but the computer is not what turns my heart. What turns my heart are the experiences and the impressions I have from the spirit and the things that I know and understand. So the reason I wanted to start out with this quote today is that as a amazing and as incredible and wonderful as our technology is, we always want to remember that the most important part of doing family history is following the spirit. If the tool enables us to follow the spirit better, we're going to have great success. If we use it in such a way that perhaps it gets in the way of following the spirit, maybe not as much. So I wanted to give that kind of as a framework for what we're going to be talking about today. So I was at work one day and one of our leaders asked us, it was a big meeting, and he said, which broom sweeps better, the new one or the old one? The automatic response of many of us was to say, well, of course, the new one, because, you know, the new one's going to be in better shape, it's going to have better features or whatever. But I think he surprised a lot of us a little bit by saying, it depends. Well, what does it depend on? It depends on how well the tool fits the job. And he said, we need to keep in mind that there are times when an unexpected tool might be a better choice. And so we don't want to um, limit our options. We want to be sure that we're acting sensibly and using the tool that's, that's right for the job. 
So today's objectives for our webinar, there are two of them. First of all, we want to compare the web and the mobile versions of Family Tree with a focus on three particular areas. First of all, we'll review the general user experience. And then I've chosen five of the most used features, at least in my experience, they're the most used. Yours might be different, but as a state consultant right now for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I work with a lot of beginners. And so these features are the ones that seem to be used very often by beginners. And then finally, each, uh, each version, if you will, of Family Tree, Web or Mobile, Mobile, both have unique features, and we're going to touch on just a couple of those. And then finally, what I'm hoping is that whether you're a person who has used the website and, you know, kind of maybe scared of mobile, or you're always on mobile and you're a little bit intimidated by the website, I hope that by going over both of these today, it will increase your comfort level with whatever one you're maybe not as comfortable with, because they're really both amazing tools. I wanted to also give you a few caveats at the beginning just to uh, set expectations. First of all, the webinar is not going to specifically address tablets like iPads. They kind of fall between a smartphone and a, a laptop or desktop. And it just frankly would have made the webinar too long. And you can extrapolate a lot of um, what we're going to talk about today. You can kind of apply different things to tablets. It, it's just kind of common sense. So, so we're not going to specifically talk about tablets. The mobile examples are Android, and so the screenshots are all Android, but my dad has an iPhone, I have an Android, and I was looking at his, and they're usually, usually pretty similar. So it, the screen may, if you're an iPhone user, the screen may not exactly match, but it will be pretty close, and I think that you'll be able to figure out even from the Android screenshots. And last of all, both the mobile app and the website are constantly changing. And I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise to any of us because they're constantly getting better. They're getting new features. The website, or excuse me, the webinar was as correct as I could make it as of today. But who knows, tomorrow you might read this or you know, get on and watch this web webinar and say, wow, that information is out of date. That's kind of to be expected. But as of today, what, what we're going to cover should be pretty accurate. So let's do a comparison of the general user experience between a mobile device and a desktop or a laptop. So the mobile device user experience, here are the major pros. It's portable. You can take it any place you want. When I'm getting ready to go to the grocery store, I keep my grocery list on my smartphone. So I throw the smartphone in my purse. I'm ready to go. I go through the store and it's just super easy to take. I'm not going to throw my laptop in my purse to go grocery shopping, but my mobile phone works great. Mobile devices are also pervasive in many places. We've got to be careful there because there are places and and segments of society and so forth, where we might take it for granted that, quote, everybody has a mobile device, but actually not everybody does. So it's pervasive in many places, and we need to be careful that we don't assume that too often. Another thing is that phones just, they're just plain fun. And I think they're the most fun for those of us who remember life without them. And honestly, I remember the exact same thing happening when PCs were first introduced back in the 80s. We were just like, whoa, you can, you can calculate numbers in a spreadsheet on the computer? Wow, that's a, and it was just fun. We were all so excited about it. But then after years pass, it just became kind of ordinary. And you're like, who would ever do a paper spreadsheet? I, you know, do you see how that kind of switched? And I'm seeing the same thing with phones now, very frankly. Uh, some people that remember what it's like not to have a smartphone, just we're still so amazed by the technology. 
But I look at my little niece and nephew who have grown up with this technology and they're like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's just to be expected. So it's lost a little bit of the fun quotient there. So I think we are going to see that shift over time. But for right now, it is perceived by a lot of people as probably being a little bit more fun than a regular computer. And the apps are usually pretty simple to use by design because you got a small screen and um, you're probably using it in a place where you might have interruptions and so forth. So they make it simple and easy for you to use. But that leads us to the cons. Uh, one of the biggest drawbacks, and I hear this actually from both adults and teenagers in my stake, is that the small screen makes it difficult to do some things. Now, there's some things it honestly doesn't matter if the screen is small, but there's some other things where it really can make a difference for you. It tends to be harder to type, but let me qualify that. To fire off a quick text message where you don't care about punctuation and spelling, that's super easy on a smartphone. To write a, a sensible reason statement on Family Tree, the Family Tree mobile app, uh, it's a little bit, for me at least, it's a lot faster on the keyboard. And uh, I've talked to other people that it's the same for them. And so it can be harder to type when you're trying to do a really good job and it's not just casual. Apps may have fewer features than their comparison website apps. What I've noticed too is that the simplicity can lead to cutting corners because we sometimes think, well, we ought to be able to do everything on a mobile app. But frankly, there are some tasks that maybe aren't as suited to a mobile app. And a mobile app is more likely to be used in a distracting environment, sometimes for family history when we're really trying to listen to the spirit, then being in a distracting environment is not necessarily uh, most conducive to success. So that's a quick summary of some of the common pros and cons of the mobile user experience. Let's take a look at the same for desktop laptop. So the pros are you've got a larger screen. You can see more at one time. A big plus for me is having multiple monitors. And I think that's true in a lot of areas, frankly. Uh, family history, I find it very helpful. But my brother-in-law is a graphic designer, and I think he's got like two monitors besides his laptop. And that's what he needs to do is work. He needs that large screen real estate. And there's lots of um, jobs that are like that, where it's very helpful to have multiple monitors and a lot of space. A desktop laptop, is, as I mentioned before, generally for quality typing, it's faster and easier. And apps will often have more features. The cons are, like we mentioned, they're less portable than mobile devices. I'm not going to often throw my laptop in my purse to go someplace, whereas I will throw my smartphone in and just dash off. And another con is that apps with more features may seem to be more complex, or in truth, they actually are more complex. And that can be um, off-putting or intimidating sometimes. So that's a general comparison of the, of the broad user experience. And I wanted to point out, it's not that one is good and one is bad. It goes back to the broom analogy. One is good for some situations, one is good for others. So let's look at a comparison of common features in Family Tree, both on the website and on the app. These are the five features that we're going to go through relatively quickly. And I wanted to mention the purpose of going through these features isn't really to give, you know, step-by-step -step detailed instructions. It's rather to give you a sense of the difference in the user experience between the two, um, between the website and the mobile app. So these are the five features that I selected. We could have done many others, but in the interest of time, I tried to pick kind of the top five or the, the ones that I use the most with beginners. First of all, viewing a tree, and when I see viewing a tree, I'm talking about the multi-generational view as opposed to just the, the person or detail view. Using the recents list, or uh, as it used to be called, the history list. Finding names in the tree. Searching partner sites, which is a huge advantage. And then also dealing with possible duplicates. So let's take a look at each one of those. And what I've done here, you'll see on the screen that when we're talking about the mobile device, there'll be a little mobile icon up here. When we're talking about the desktop, that icon will change to a desktop.
So if for the mobile family tree app, there is one multi-generational view, and that's portrait. And you can see it there on the screen. And one challenge with it is it tends to be very small if you want to see a lot of people. And of course, you can zoom in, and then you see larger text, but you see fewer people. One thing you can do, as many of you are, are no doubt aware, is that you can rotate your screen, and then that gives you a little bit more room. You see fewer generations, but you see larger text and um, larger icons and so forth. So that gives you a little flexibility there for you to get the best view that you want for the tree view on the app. The tree view on the website has four different varieties. You've got your landscape view, you've got portrait, same as mobile, you've got the fan chart view, which is my absolute favorite. So for me, when I want to look at multi-generational, I'm probably going to go to the website just because of the fan chart. And then we've got the sentency view. So as a a website views user, you've got your choice of any of those four views. And frankly, I switch between them depending on what I need to do. So, and you may do the same. Okay, that's multi-generational views. Let's talk about recents. So on the, the recents list is a list of the last 50, up to the last 50 people that you have visited in your um, work on the Family Tree website or on the app. So on the app, the way that you access the recents list is by this nifty little icon at the top. And when you tap it, you're going to get that list of all the people that you've recently visited or the last 50 people. Let's take a look at the, the key features of using recents on the mobile app. So first of all, you swipe through the list to find a name. So you just use your finger to swipe up and down. I'm gesturing here as if you could see me, and now I'm laughing at myself. But you know what I mean. You can picture it. You just swipe up and down. And then you tap a name, and it goes directly to the person's screen. You can also input a PID up here at the top to go directly to the person's screen. And the cool thing is that PID does not have to be in your recents list. So basically, like the other day I was working with a stake member and she had some PIDs written on a piece of paper. So she could just type that PID right into the, the box up there, tap, uh, there'll be like, as soon as you do that, I as I recall on the Android, the word find will appear in that green bar and then you just tap find and it takes you to the person page for that person. So that's a really cool feature that you can go even if that person's not in the list. Whoops, oh, I knew I was gonna do that. Do you know what, There's an. I'm not using my regular computer and there is an end key right by the page down key. So let me get back to where we were. Let's see, recents. Okay, and I will be more careful on that in the future. So, the one trick about this that is different from the website is in that box, you can only put a complete PID. If you type a partial PID and try to search on that, or if you even type text like the name of somebody, uh, then it's not going to uh, find that person. It's going to say the result uh, like not found when you try to search for them. So that's one thing to be aware of when using the mobile app. Now let's take a look at recents on the website. You get to recents by choosing recents from the secondary family tree menu. And when you do that, you get a list that looks similar to the one that you see on your screen. So let's go through the key features here so that you can see how this is different from the mobile app experience. In the search box at the top, you can search by any characters, and strictly speaking, it's not really a search, it's a filter. So in other words, as you type anything in that box up there that says enter name or ID, it's going to filter that list. So for instance, if I type the word Jesse in there, then the only thing that would show on that list is anybody with uh, the name Jesse uh, as all or part of their name. You can also enter the PID and click go to go to the person page and the PID also here doesn't have to be in the list. And again, I love that. It's just a, a really nice convenience to navigate quickly to a PID. 
Oh, and I should say, when I say PID, I, it's a little bit older terminology, but I like it because it's so descriptive. It stands for person ID. So every person in Family Tree, whether you're using the mobile app or the website, has a seven-digit identifier. It identifies them uniquely. And so when I say PID, that's what we're talking about. On this screen, you can see them right here. That's a PID, that's a PID, that's a PID, so forth. So you can click, oh, here's the other thing that I think is really cool about using Recents on the website, and that is that you've got two options when you choose a person from your Recents list. You can either click the person's name to go to their person page, or you can click the pedigree icon and you go to the tree view with them in the so-called root or central position. So that's kind of nice to have both those options of either going to the person page or going to them in the tree view in the context of their whole multi-generational lines. Okay, let's talk about finding somebody in Family Tree. So, or in the, actually, let's say in the Tree app. So, on any page in the app, you will see, uh, let me get that up there, you will see this, the little three bars that indicate that there is a menu. So, you tap on that and you get this menu. You want to choose Find a Person, and when you do that, you get taken to a screen that allows you to search by name or by ID. So let's go through the key um, features of using Find in the mobile app. You can find by name or PID. Find by ID goes directly to the person screen. Find by name can include birth, death, parents, and spouse. And you can kind of see part of that here. It didn't all fit on the screen. If when I'm on my phone, I actually have to scroll down to see the rest of that. What's really interesting in the find function on the app is what you get when you hit find right up here. That's what I was actually talking about earlier is this little find uh, text up here. So you tap that to initiate the search. And when you do that, this is what you get. So it's quite a bit different from the website if you're familiar with how Find works in the website. This, these screens right here are basically, they're all part of one long scroll that, uh, that you scroll through when you do a find. And so I didn't, I actually cut out part of the country stuff and cut out part of the names, but just because it wouldn't otherwise fit on the screen. But let's walk through the main parts of the results that you get whenever you search for somebody. So the first thing you're going to get is a surname count in Family Tree. That is not given on the website, and it's kind of cool, but I also, it threw me a little bit. I was like, wait, I was trying to search for a person in Family Tree. Why am I getting a surname count? Because while it's interesting, it's not really, it wasn't really my goal at this point of time. So then you scroll down and you see countries where the name is found. And again, that's really cool. But again, I was like, well, gosh, by this time, I'm starting to wonder, did I hit the wrong button or something? Because I'm, I really wanted to just find my person in Family Tree, and I'm getting this other cool stuff, but it wasn't really what I was looking for. But eventually, when I scrolled down, I did get to the point where it showed me the people in the tree, and then I could tap any of those people to go to their person page. And then finally, at the bottom, it's got a list of historical records. Now, you might be saying, oh, historical records that it thinks might pertain to the person that you were searching for. Now, one thing about this is you might be wondering, what if I want to revise my search parameters? That I could discover. There wasn't a simple way to do that in the app. But if you hit the back button of your device, it will take you to that previous screen where you can revise your search parameters and redo the search. So that's find on a mobile app, on the mobile app. Let's look at how it works in the website. So on the website, you get to it by just clicking find in that secondary menu. And when you do, you get these features. You get find by name and find by ID, just exactly the same as the mobile app. You actually, though, get a lot more options for entering search parameters. So you can include the birth, the death, the parents, the spouse, 
the marriage, the residence, and a year range for those things, which is really helpful. So if you're needing more flexibility, the website offers that for you. And then finally, you can also choose match all exactly. And that's really helpful if you're getting too many search results and you want to narrow it down. You say, I only want a Bescoby, a John Bescoby with this exact spelling. I only want it with this exact birthplace and this exact year range and so forth. Actually, you know, now that I look at that, looks like exact doesn't apply to the range. But anything that has a checkbox up here, that can be matched exactly. So that's kind of a nice feature if you want to narrow down your search results. When you uh, run the search, what you're going to get is a list of matches. And so that, to me, was probably a little more intuitive. But if you know what to expect on the mobile app, then it's fine, too, because you can just scroll down to wherever you need to be to see the results. Okay, here are the... Um, things to note about using find on the website. And that is that you'll just get that matching list of names displayed on the right hand side and your search parameters are displayed on the left so that if you need to rerun that search, for instance, maybe I wanted to use a wild card up here for Bescoby. I wanted um, maybe anything with a B followed by any vowel. So I'd put a question mark there and the rest of it. And then I could rerun that search and um, just very easily from this screen. There's like an update button down here. It doesn't show it was cut off of this screenshot, but you would just scroll down and, and click like update or search or something to rerun that search. Okay, searching partner sites. This is something that I use so often and that new users absolutely love. Family Search has made it so easy to search other partner sites like Ancestry or Find My Past or My Heritage and so forth. So the way you do that on the mobile app, it's not immediately obvious, but it's not difficult either. So what you need to do is go up to this, uh, you could actually, excuse me, you, you go to the sources portion of the person screen. So you just tap sources. And when you do that, you get this page where if there are already sources, they'll be listed there. And of course, it will be empty if nobody's added any sources yet. Then on this page, you click the plus. Now you might be saying, why didn't I click the plus on the other page? And that's because if you click the plus over here, it's, it's in the context of the vitals. So what it's going to do if you click plus here is going to allow you to add information about this person, not search for partner sites or search partner sites. So you do need to tap sources first and then you come over here and you hit the plus sign at the bottom and you get this menu down here. And so you choose search records and when you do that, you get this list of partners. So for this example, I'm going to choose Ancestry.com. So I click that and I get this little note that says, hey, we're going to search Ancestry.com for you and it's going to open in the browser. So you click search or tap search and you go to Ancestry.com and it runs a search for you based on the information on that person's screen. This just amazes me. I still think this is one of the coolest features in family search apps, whether web or mobile, because it just makes it so easy to search for any search for more information for anybody that's in Family Tree. So that's how it works on the mobile app. Let's look at how it works on the website. On the website, those partners are listed right on the person page. And again, this is just really, in my mind, a function of the space. So there wasn't really room to put this on the screen in the mobile app, but on the website there is. And so you have these partners listed over to the right-hand side, and we're going to choose Ancestry. And you click Ancestry, it grabs the information here to use running the search, and you go over to Ancestry, and or at, you know you click the logo, it immediately takes you to Ancestry, and you see these search results based on the information on the person page. So that has just made it so easy to quickly do research on anybody who's in Family Tree. Okay, last uh, commonly used feature is possible duplicates. So on the app, there is not a, an immediate visual cue as to whether there's a duplicate or not. You notice there is a little cue about a record hint, but there's no cue about 
a possible duplicate. The way that you see whether a record has a possible duplicate is you tap, oh, I forgot the little call out. Sorry, you guys. I should have had like a red call out there. So you tap this three dot menu and it drops down this menu and one of the options is possible duplicates. So when you tap that, you get taken to a screen that lists all the possible duplicates and it gives you the opportunity to review them and to do a merge if appropriate. And I considered walking through the whole merge thing, but again, it was kind of making the webinar too long. And so just know that you can get to the merge point. The merge is very, very similar to the, the website. The only difference, the only real notable difference that I saw is that the person to be deleted is on the left instead of on the right. But they color code it very clearly, so it's very obvious which person gets deleted. So let's look at possible duplicates on the website. On the website, a possible duplicate is flagged at the top with this red exclamation point. And so to resolve that duplicate, you just click it and you get this little fly out. You click review merge and you get taken to the screen where you can merge. There are unique features in each, uh, wh whether the mobile app or in the, the desktop, there's unique features. And so I wanted to talk about a couple of the fun and useful ones that are, are they're a little bit different between the two. So a lot of you may have used relatives around me. That is where if there are other people within, I think it's up like 100 yards of you, who are also on the app, you can tell if and how they are related to you. I've used this a couple of times when working, for instance, at a, a young men, young women's night, but also, frankly, it's just as fun for Relief Society sisters. It's just a really cool way you go, hey, no way, you're my fourth cousin two times removed or something, someone you had no idea you were so closely related to. So the way you use that is you tap the menu up there and one of the choices is relatives around me. When you do that, you get this little page of instructions, makes it super easy to use, and then you tap scan for friends. When you do that, you get a list of anybody else and they do have to be signed into the app, but anybody else who's using the app and um, is within a close distance of you. So that's just really fun. Another feature that is really new, which I was just absolutely thrilled about, is the ability to request to review the relationship of a user, not just a deceased person in the tree. So any place that you see a user's name, you can tap that name, and you get this little pop-up screen. And the, one of the new options is request to view relationship. So when you tap that, you get, I mean, they couldn't make it easier, right? It opens up a message for you. It's all, they've given you this sample draft. You can edit it. If you look at that and go, ah, oh, that doesn't really sound like me. Well, that's fine. You just go ahead and change, you know, tweak the wording or whatever. But you may look at it and go, hey, that's totally good with me. I'm going to send this. And then it sends that to the person. And if they agree, then you're able to see how you are related to that person. And that is just so awesome to be able to collaborate with people. And I think it gives you a sense of connection with that person. You know, they're not just some random user. They're somebody that they're part of your family and a pretty close family member at that. So this is a really cool feature. This is not yet available on the website, but I understand from Ron Tanner that it is coming. I don't know exactly when, but keep your eyes open because we will be seeing this in the future. A unique feature to the website, which I absolutely love, is the ability to tag sources. And let me show you why I think that is so significant and so helpful. So you guys probably recognize that this is the source linker screen, where I'm adding a source to a person and family tree. In this case, I'm adding the 1901 census to my relative John Burt. When you add any kind of record, Family Tree is smart enough to say, you know, this is a census, so probably it's going to have information about the name of the person, when they were born, where they were born, and their sex. So it, re it pre tags those items for you, but of course you can untag them if 
by any chance, you know, in one thing, the birth information wasn't or wasn't listed. Like one time I went in and it just said not known. So in that case, the source didn't provide evidence of the birth. So I could just uncheck that. So the tags, you may be saying, well, that's all well and good, but where does that show up? How, how is that useful? The place that it shows up, oh, sorry, forgot about that. We've got the tags there. So the place that it shows up is on the person page. So if you go to birth information and you click that edit link right there, you get taken to a place where the tagged sources show up. And you can actually click any of those sources and see more information. So this is something that is really useful because you can see immediately what are the sources that provide evidence for this person's birth. Now, the 1901 that we just added is actually further down the screen, so it didn't uh, show up in this screenshot, but it is further down below. So any source that's been tagged to birth is going to show up here. And that's really useful just for being comfortable that the birth is well substantiated. But also, the other day I was working with my dad, and we looked at some of those sources, and they were completely not for the person that we were researching. They had been attached erroneously to the person. And so that also made it easy to see, wow, this is for, you know, some different guy that was born in a totally different place and 10 years later. And so that kind of alerted us, well, we really need to remove those sources because they don't apply to this person. Another unique feature that is right now only available on the website is the ability to see a list of people that you're watching. So you probably remember that at the top of a person page, there's that star. And if you're concerned about changes being made to a person, you can click that star and it's going to alert you whenever somebody makes changes. And so, but sometimes you might not uh, keep track or you might not remember everybody that you've put a watch on. Well, the easy way to see the list is to just click lists up here in the menu and then you get a list of everybody you're watching. And you can click over here, changes to people I'm watching and see who has recently um, had a change made to them. So that uh, concludes our review of the features. I wanted to just say a word about youth. We as adults sometimes are very quick to make assumptions about youth that actually aren't true. And I hear that a lot with uh, mobile devices. People think, oh, every youth, they're just so into mobile devices. Everybody, every youth has one, and they're never going to want to use the website. I went into my calling thinking that that was the case. I was surprised that when I worked with youth in my stake, there are youth that prefer using the website. I was like, really? This is not what I had assumed. But I think now that I think about it, it's because a lot of them, you know, they don't do all their homework on their mobile device. They don't necessarily write a report on a mobile device. We're really living in a world where people use both. And so the youth that I'm working with are comfortable with the mobile device and with the website. There's another wrinkle, and that is that some parents don't allow their teens to have mobile phones. And so if we go with the expectation, expectation that every teen's going to have a mobile phone, that's not necessarily the case. And we don't ever want to make a teen feel bad, or maybe I should say worse than they already do, that their parents didn't feel it was wise for them to have a mobile phone. But you probably, for those of you who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you probably remember that conference talk where the story was told of a mother who got a distinct spiritual prompting that she was to take away her son's smartphone and give him a flip phone. And she did. And it changed everything for that boy. And he was very angry at first. Later, he thanked her. So as users of the device or helpers, whether we're consultants or whatever, we never want to make a youth or their parents feel bad that the youth doesn't have a mobile phone, and they can absolutely do what they need to on the website as well. So we just want to be cautious there and respectful of both the parents and the youth. 
And I would state that as you meet the youth where they are. If they're like, they want to use a mobile phone and they're absolutely not willing to use the website or have no interest in it, well, don't push them. You know, just let them, yeah, work with them on the, the mobile app. On the other hand, if they say, like my friend Elsa did, no, I'd really rather use the website great, let's use the website. Whatever's comfortable for them, meet them where they are, they are and help them have a successful family history experience. So some final observations for everything that we've talked about today. Mobile and web both have strengths and weaknesses. It's just a reality of life. You hear people say sometimes, oh, mobile's going to replace desktop and people just in the future, nobody's going to use a desktop. I actually don't foresee that happening. I don't think that's the case. I really believe that users will most likely continue to need and to use both. And we see some evidence of that by virtue of the fact that many cloud services offer to let you keep your devices in sync. So for instance, Google lets you keep your, your desktop and your mobile device in synchronization. I did some research in preparation for this webinar. I went to a site called Proficient, where they do, and it is, it is what it sound. I'm not like slaughtering the word proficient. It is really P-E-R, efficient. So they do studies on web and mobile data, and they, there was some really interesting stuff on that website. Some of the figures about mobile usage show that it's very, very high, that many visitors to a site are mobile visitors. But when they broke it down, this is both intriguing and a little bit heartbreaking. They found that the, the two biggest uh, the, the two biggest categories of sites where mobile use was the highest, I, that didn't sound right. I, I think you know what I mean. Mobile usage was the highest on two types of sites, pornography and gambling. So overall statistics, they were up like in the 70s and 80 percentage, 80, 70 to 80 percent of their users are mobile for what we could call vice sites. When you went down to other sites that are more uh, legitimate or whatever you would want to call it, for instance, academic sites, business sites, and so forth, the usage was split pretty much 50-50. It was about 50 to 60 percent. So in legitimate sites, users are using both devices. Well, actually, let me take a step back on that. That was actually my assumption is that they're using both because the research that I saw didn't break it down by whether the same user visited the site both on their desktop and with their mobile device. But based on my own experience and the experience of my friends, I'm assuming that that's the case a lot. Like I go to LinkedIn on my app and I go to LinkedIn on the website. I do email on my app, I do email on the website. Sometimes it depends on what, like where I already am. So if I'm already on my phone and an email comes in, I'll just answer it there. But if, and if it's quick and short, but if I'm already on my laptop and an email comes in, I'll answer it there. Nowadays, users want the flexibility to be able to use both. And it just depends when and where you are. Uh, as a, a family history related example, the other day I was in the grocery store, I was in Harmon's, for those of you familiar with that, in the checkout line, and it was long and I was bored. And I'm like, ah, I've got some sources I want to attach to family trees. So I pulled out the app and I started attaching sources. But let me make a comment on that as well. I think doing like brainless stuff, well, not brainless, but you know, stuff that doesn't require a high degree of concentration. I mean, the source was a no brainer. I knew it was for that person. It was very easy to attach. So doing kind of no brainer stuff in a checkout line in the grocery store, absolutely. And it was a great way to spend that time that I would have otherwise just been going, oh my goodness, this is taking so long, whatever. Would I do the sacred process of clearing a temple name in a grocery checkout line? Probably not, because I feel like it's so important to have the guidance of the spirit when you're doing something like that. So again, it comes back to what's the best use of the tool? What's the best tool for the job? So that sh I think that should be our guiding principle rather than, yeah, I, I just always use mobile or yeah, I just always use web. Use the one that's, that's right for the tool and right for the circumstance.
So if you're a helper, if you're helping other people, you're going to run into people that both love the mobile device and are scared of it and love the website and are scared of it. So if you're a helper, get familiar with both of them so that you're comfortable with both. And then that way you can help people where they're comfortable. So which broom sweeps better? The one that fits the job. And that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. And Marin, do we have any questions? Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment, um, but I'll just leave this screen up. And if you have any comments or questions, you can type those into the chat box. And uh, Catherine's presentation is available at that link uh, right here. Um, uh, tinyurl.com uh, slash fh hyphen resources. That link will also be made available on uh, the post, uh, which will be on our YouTube and on our website. So if you need that, it will be there. All right, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, if you have any more comments or questions, you're go you can go ahead and type them. Um, you also can email me at uh, fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu, and I can send those on to Catherine for you. A uh, recording of this webinar will be made available on our YouTube page and our website no later than Monday morning. And uh, just a reminder, on the 8th of August, Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain Time, we'll be having a presentation with James Tanner on the history of uh, DNA. So make sure that you catch that. Um, if you have any comments or questions uh, besides this presentation, you're welcome to email me um, or visit our website, which is fh.lib.byu.edu. Thank you so much, and we hope that you have a wonderful weekend.